Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Fronteras, a changing America. I'm Anthony Moreno. On this episode, we feature a discussion on higher education in our region. Dr. Monica Torres, president of Doniana Community College, will join us in a few minutes. But first, we take a look at one of the challenges facing college students, hunger. Last year, the New Mexico Higher Education Department awarded $100,000 to colleges across the state to alleviate student hunger. KRWG Public Media scholar Noah Race has more on what local higher education institutions are doing to help students facing food insecurity. Transitioning to college can be tough for many students seeking a higher education. Balancing work, school, and often living alone for the first time can quickly become daunting, and food insecurity is often a problem. You know, in a given clinic day, you know, we'll see it. We'll see it once a day easily. Dr. Kate Nixon is an osteopathic physician at Mountain View. She says that food insecurity can affect people in many different ways. You're also going to see um, a higher incidence of obesity because hunger is going to lead you to choose um, foods that are more available and um, more affordable, which is, is really junk food, unfortunately. For many people, the effects don't stop there. Food insecurity has been shown to negatively affect energy levels, cognitive ability, and the ability to concentrate in both kids and adults. We know that the academic performance does suffer, for sure, in those populations. According to the Journal of Hunger and Environmental Nutrition, college students face food insecurity at a rate that is at least three times as much as the U.S. household average. Amanda Nunez with the NMSU food pantry Aggie Cupboard knows this well. A lot of students always kind of like, do I pay a bill or do I buy groceries? So this kind of compensates that pressure that they actually have on their plates. Aggie Cupboard has been helping the NMSU population since 2012 and gave away nearly 26,000 pounds of food just in 2021. Nunez says that part of their success is how easy it is for students who may be struggling to get help. It's very, you know, accessible for the students who aren't able to commute off of campus, who financially cannot commute off of campus. Um, a lot of our international students utilize the pantry. NMSU is not the only school running a food pantry. Earlier this year, DACC opened up their own on the Espina campus with the hopes of having similar results. This actually helps them a lot because it's the stress of I don't have the food on my plate to be able to study properly, to concentrate correctly. Um, also, the stress of I need to miss class so I can attend work in order to be able to provide food for myself and my family. So this is how we're trying to reach out to the students and help them. While the food pantry may have only opened in February, the results look promising. It's actually been a great experience to see how much it's helped all of our students right now. We've actually served over 250 students already. The excitement that they get, you know, the appreciation that they show, everything that we've just basically utilized to help them, they do show a lot of appreciation and, and you can see that they're grateful for everything that we've provided so far. New Mexico as a whole still staggers behind the rest of the country when it comes to food insecurity. As more programs like these are introduced, many are optimistic that a dent could be put in those numbers. For KRWG Public Media, I'm Noah Race. Joining us now to talk more about this issue and other issues facing higher education is Dr. Monica Torres, president of Doña Ana Community College. Dr. Torres will also share some exciting news happening at the college. Dr. Torres, thank you so much for joining us. Great, thank you, I'm very happy to be here. I'd like to start off with that issue of student hunger. How do you think adding a food pantry at the community college is going to make an impact for students? You know, one of the things we know about student learning is that if they've got other things they're concerned about, if they're having some of their basic needs that aren't being met, it's difficult to learn. So in having a student pantry, and we have a, a large one located uh, on, on the Espina campus of DACC, and smaller ones located at our other locations, um, making uh, food accessible to people 
essentially not only provides for their basic needs, it also creates a more advantageous environment for their learning. Um, and so um, that's, that's why we did it. it it's, we're trying to say to them, we care about you, we're invested in your learning, and here are some resources to help you do that. How do you connect with the students to, to let them know, hey, it's okay to get help? You know, that's, that's one of the, the issues, I think, that we have when we do things like, like pantries, right? I think one of the things that, when I talk about this, what I really want to say is that we all need resources. We all need resources to be successful students, successful employees. Some of us have those resources in our families. Some of those have those resources available to us in our networks. So I want them to think, DACC is part of their network. There are resources available to them. And, and I want to encourage them to access them because they're tools that they need for their lives, that we all need for our lives. We just have different ways of accessing those, those resources. In all the conversations you have with your students at DACC, what are some of the top issues uh, besides hunger that you think they're dealing with? You know, one of the things that um, that we've been talking about in higher ed for a few years now is this idea of basic needs and wraparound services. And um, so they talk about things like childcare, they talk about transportation, housing security, food security. I mean, those are the kinds of things that lots of students, uh, again, they just need their networks that can provide resources to them in, in those things. Because those are the kinds of things that if you're hungry, um, if your car breaks down, if you have a flat tire and you can't get to school or you can't get to, to your job, those are the kinds of things that will really stop progress for a student. And, and so part of what, what we're trying to do is understand how that plays out in our students' lives and then make sure that, that again, we make resources available, that we're part of their network for, for how they, how they uh, get their needs met. How do you feel the education is going uh, to inform students about all of these resources that may be available? You know, one of the things that I'm really proud of at DACC is we have a, we have a program that was initially funded by Kellogg um, in our southern part of the county, and now we've scaled it to the rest of the institution. It's called Avanza, uh, which is in, uh, Spanish for advancing. Um, and it's, it's basically a program that says, uh, we've got uh, human beings here to help you connect to resources. So one of the things we see that organization doing is we see them get wide scale information out to students. So it's through text, through it's posters, through social media, those sorts of things so that the information is just accessible to them. Like here are the resources for you. Um, in addition to that, those are, those are folks who are also working with faculty members to identify are there specific students or are there particular gaps that they're seeing in their students when they come to classes. And then they will reach out to individual students uh, should that be necessary. So they're trying to work the one-on-one -on -one level, but also at the broad scale to make sure people get that information. A uh, food pantry, uh, a major resource to taking on food insecurity for students. What other resources are available for students at DACC that may be facing challenges? You know, one of the things that uh, this organization does within DACC Avanza is they also are trying to connect people to community resources. So there are wraparound resources that we think about in terms of the college. We think about kind of uh, advising, right? What we call intrusive advising, but really it's just assertive advising. Make sure that they know that they connect with a human being on, on, on what they need, uh, who works for the institution. But um, also tutoring, those are the kinds of things that we know make a difference in students' lives that are internal to the college. But one of the other vital things is how do we connect people to um, the rest of the community? There may be resources, for example, around housing and security, that if we can connect them to the right place. We will also, from time to time, bring the resources to campus, right, so that they can actually connect with those community resources while they're on campus. So for example, a number of students will have um, childcare issues, right? And so what we'll try to do is connect them with those agencies in the community and state agencies that will, um, that where they can access uh, childcare, in some cases, uh, information about childcare, and in some cases, vouchers for childcare. So, so that's part of what we do, is how do, we, how do we connect them from the college to the community, but often we'll bring the community to the college so that students can have access to those resources. Poverty, uh, a major issue in New Mexico across the state. How much does that impact your strategic planning? At the, uh, at the college? A lot. So one of the things that uh, over COVID, DCC lost 20% of its enrollment during, during that two, two and a half year period. When we actually looked at the data a little more closely, what we saw is the students who were most impacted were um, first generation students, 
students with um, children or other dependents that they were responsible for, and students in low income circumstances. And so when we think about um, what it takes to access a college environment um, and to be successful, we know that people need to have support of a variety of sources. And, and one of that is just money. We know money makes a difference to people. So for example, we have an emergency fund. Um, if your tire blows, if you need a repair, if you can't pay your electric bill, we have an emergency fund that people can access. Um, in, a, in addition to that, you know, we have a, a number of other sources, like the food pantry is, is another one, um, trying to get people just that resource they need at the moment to, to be able to continue. But, but it's poverty is something we're always thinking about and are thinking um, how, do we, how do we make a difference and how do we roll that into the fabric of what we do and not as an addition to what we do, but it is what we do. And so it, it is central to the work we think of um, in terms of strategic planning. In terms of enrollment, uh, how is that going right now? We know that uh, there has been an increase in enrollment in some colleges across the state, state lawmakers have taken steps to introduce funding and scholarships like the Opportunity Scholarship. Uh, how is DACC doing with enrollment? You know, so as I mentioned, we lost about 20% enrollment during COVID. In the fall of 22, we had about a 3% increase from the previous fall. This spring, we had a 4% increase from last spring. So we're slowly, I, I think the recovery is a little slower than I thought it would be, um, but uh, I, I'm seeing that we'll, we'll have some recovery increases for, for some period of time. What do you think are some of the biggest reasons why students are deciding to go to DACC? I think, I think there are a variety of reasons why people choose to go to DACC. There, there are a set of programs that we have available at DACC that aren't available at the university, for example. All the career technical education programs, that, that was essentially the founding of DACC almost 50 years ago. Um, and so there are those programs that they're just not going to get, water technology, uh, welding, automotive, um, uh, respiratory therapy, just a variety of, of objects. So that's those people who are interested in those careers, that's, that's where they need to go. But I think there are other things. I think community colleges have been really good about keeping classes small, about thinking, and, and our first mission is teaching, right? That, that is um, our unambiguous mission is teaching. And so I think the focus on, on teaching resources has, has made it uh, helpful and desirable for lots of students to, to come to DACC. And, and I think when they get there, they find that faculty are invested in their learning. I, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I've worked at seven institutions across, across uh, the state and, and in a couple of other places. Um, and I'm as lucky as I can be to work with the faculty and the staff that I work with who've just got a serious investment in, in student learning. I want to talk with you about faculty and staff recruiting and retaining right. quality faculty and staff is a challenge for any right. higher education institution. What are some of the challenges that are, are unique to DACC and what are some steps that, that uh, you have taken to address this issue? You know, some of them are uh, common across the country, right? We, we know that COVID opened up this space where we have to think about um, different sort of work environments, people working remotely, right? And, and many of the jobs at a community college can be done remotely or partially remotely. Um, what's a unique challenge is that um, DACC is also a hub for the community, right? And so we wanna be a face-to-face, -face kind of vibrant, uh, location for people from, from our community to engage. And so one of the challenges for us is how do we navigate being a vibrant physical location that people can come to, right, and access, and offer uh, not just the remote work opportunities, but obviously the w remote learning opportunities for people. So that's one of the really interesting challenges that we're facing now is that how do we manage those two? How do we, how do we balance those two and ha how do we think about them? So, so the New Mexico State University system, it, like like across the country developed alternative working arrangements. But part of what we're having to do at C DACC is think, how does this work for us? What is it that we're trying to achieve as a community college and, and how do we use the structure to, to help us do that? But that's certainly one of the big ones. You know, the other one is, is really uh, wages. You know, how do we, we want to have a supportive environment, but we also want to be competitive for wages. And I think that, you know, the world has changed, the world has changed on that. And of course, some disciplines, uh, nursing, for example, and teachers right now, education, for example, you know, the market really is, is having us think, having to think more flexibly about how we manage wages.
What about online education? During the pandemic, so many uh, universities and colleges had to turn to online education uh, immediately. And right. so what did you learn from that experience and how does that impact the future of online education at DACC? You know, one of the things that we learned is there there are some things that you really have to do hand on, right? You hands on. You really have to weld, you know, on you know, hands on. You have to be right there. Uh, but it was it was interesting. So there so when we went we turned to I would say 90% of our classes were online probably during the pandemic. Um, and, and we did that for, there are some programs and some courses that are, you can go 100% online and, and you lose the face-to-face, -face, whatever that offers to people, but we could do it. And then there's some that we couldn't do that, right? Where it's like, no, no, this lab really has to be face-to-face, -face, so how do we take, uh, how do we take precautions given, given the pandemic? But one of the things we also learned is that in those programs that we often think about as needing to be face-to-face, -face, there are portions of that program that can be online. And our students were telling us, oh, I'm so glad that I can do this. I don't have to take an hour off of work to come for this, this class that, that could be online. And so we had to, we, we're really having to think, how do we be flexible? What can meet our needs of quality instruction online? And, and what do we need to have face-to-face? realizing again as I was talking about the balance realizing that there are some people who really thrive in a face-to-face -face environment there's some people who thrive in an online environment and we really are trying to figure out what what is that mix right now but it opened up opportunities for students there's just absolutely no doubt about it it created opportunities for students who really couldn't come to campus and take time away from their jobs or time away from their families and and so for us, that's that's what we continue to pursue: is what are the opportunities here that are provided, uh, that we need to continue to provide that we learned from the pandemic. Speaking of the pandemic, uh, what do you think is the biggest thing you learned from the pandemic as a leader in higher education? <laughs> um, I think we've known this for a while, but higher education is radically changing. We're at a moment, I believe, of radical change in higher education and how we do things. And I think that has to do with uh, that the student populations were getting, always true at the community colleges, but now also becoming true at four-year institutions, is diversifying. Uh, we, we know that um, technology and how technology is changing higher education um, is, is uh, an environment that's we're, we're not going back, right? It, it's just altering what we're doing. We know that knowledge is just, is increasing more and more rapidly. So I think what COVID told us unambiguously is that we are in an environment where rapid change is occurring. Um, and that means all of, um, in some cases, the confusion, the multiple approaches, the many, many ideas about how do we deal with it. So for me, it's like, oh, this is our world. This is the world we live in. It's a world of rapid change. It's a world of diverse human populations. Um, and, and let's not pretend we're stable. Let's, let's create, create the best environment we can given a changing world. I wanna move on and talk about some exciting things happening at DACC. The creation of a creative campus. I know you're very excited about this. Can you share with us how do you think this is going to make an impact not only for the education of students, but for the community? You know, people have been talking in, at the NMSU, in the NMSU system for a long time about the creative campus and, and locating our film and digital media programs there. Um, and so we've been working actively for the last couple of years, but it really will be a location where we have uh, industry and educators in the same location at Arrowhead Park on the NMSU campus, um, addressing kind of the educational needs, but also the production needs of, of um, our community and, and, and the industry. What it's gonna provide for students, it's gonna put them in proximity to real work right um, and a lot of our students do real work in those programs right they get into they get into industry and do internships and those sorts of things this is going to be the campus the location and so I, I think that on the one hand for students it introduces them to the industry much more quickly right and it makes it part of their everyday life but the second thing is I think for our community it promises economic development it pr pr promises the development of a workforce um, that's more rapidly prepared for for uh, the work 
More exciting news at DACC, the expansion of the nursing program, uh, funding around nearly $3 million to help do this and expand to the southern part of Doniana County. Absolutely. Can you explain with us how you think this is gonna make an impact? It's gonna make a huge impact. So we know that we need nurses. We need nurses everywhere, right? That's That became patently obvious during the pandemic as well. But it was it was true before. So we're gonna have uh, a nursing program is expanding to our Sunland Park campus, uh, which is right on kind of the Sunland Park, El Paso, obviously, um, border. Um, we actually are recruiting for students now, right? We're, hi we're in the process of hiring faculty, hiring advisors, and, and we will be up and running in the fall. Now, one other thing that you all have been doing is offering free dental clinics uh, yeah. in the area. Uh, it also provides um, some uh, real experience for students and a community resource, obviously. So can you share with us uh, of just how long it's been going on and how it can really uh, provide this resource for the community? It's funny, I, I can't tell you how long we've had. A, we have a dental clinic at the Espina campus and we've had so for a very long time, uh, well over 10 years and, and perhaps a little longer. Um, and we also have dental chair at the Gadsden Center um, down in the southern part of the county. We also have um, three or four community locations, we have dental chairs. And you're right, what it does for our program is it provides real live environments for our students. What it provides for the community is, is access uh, for dental care. And one of the things that, that we know is that dental care is basically a signal of overall health. Um, we only have about a minute left with you, but I'd like to give you an opportunity to share some things that you're really excited about that we haven't gone over yet. You know, one of the big pressures on higher education right now is that there's all sorts of uh, players that are now entering the post-secondary uh, teaching market. One of the things that, that we recognize is that some, some industries really need certificates and associate degrees. Some of them need non-credit training, right, and industry recognized credentials. So one of the things happening also in the southern part of the county is um, uh, Union Pacific uh, funded what we call an Industrial Careers Academy, the UP Industrial Careers Academy, where we're training people, um, short-term training to get people into um, the workforce for some of the things that are happening in the southern part of the county at Santa Teresa at the industrial park. For me, that's exciting. We, we know how to do credit. We've done credit for a long time and we continue to expand in, in new ways. Uh, this, this expansion into non-credit instruction in, 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 in collaboration with um, industry, for me, is one of, the, one of the very exciting things we're doing. Dr. Monica Torres, president of Doniana Community College, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, I appreciate it. We now take you to a museum on the campus of New Mexico State University in Las Cruces that shares contemporary and historical visual art while providing educational experiences for students and our community. On this Community Connection, former producer Ralph Escandon shares more about the University Art Museum on the NMSU campus. My name is Marissa Sage. I'm director of the University Art Museum here on the campus of NMSU, and we are in the brand new University Art Museum in Devastali Hall. We are specifically in the Zane Bennett Collection Study Room, which is the first study room of its kind having to do with the NMSU permanent collection. But also in this study room, we'll have art history seminars where our art historians will actually use the artworks in their classroom and teach their students from actual artworks. One of the most exciting features of this new museum is the storage unit that you're in right now. This storage vault is state of the art. It is the top of the line museum storage vault. It has a state of the art fire suppression system, which is actually a gas based system. So if there is a fire, it extinguishes it immediately. And that doesn't leave any residue on any of our precious objects in this collection. This system is laid out so that not only can we easily show people the treasures that are in our collection, we've got Luis Jimenez, who is, uh, uh, his, his studio is in Hondo, but he's from El Paso. So this is a way that we can quickly show people some of the gems within our collection. We can easily photograph the works that are in our collection. And this is a much easier system for us to be able to pull works from when people request them. This is our new Margie and Barbie Rankin Retablo Gallery. 
and it is the first time in the history of our Retablo collection that we will be able to show a portion of our collection at all times to our communities on campus and off campus. This is really exciting because we were never able to show the collection at all except in a collection exhibition we would do every three years. So this is the first time that people will be able to see them on a permanent basis. This is also a teaching museum. So within this exhibition, we have a curation that was done as part of a class where one of our MA students curated from our modern and contemporary collection works about motherhood. So this exhibition really sets the tone for this new building. The museum will be open Tuesday through Sunday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. This museum is imperative, a really important element to our region because it's one of the only contemporary art institutions in southern New Mexico. And so we really have the opportunity here to bring in some artists that are making really exciting work right now and share it with our community. And also have our community share the importance and the values that exist here with those artists. That's it for this week's episode. You can view past episodes of Fronteras at Changing America by visiting our website, krwg.org, where you can stay updated with the news anytime. Thank you for joining us this week. I'm Anthony Morano. We'll see you next time.